Welcome back, everybody, to episode number 87 of the DanJohnUniversity.com podcast. Don't forget, if you're not a member of Dan John University, hey, why don't you sign up? But you can also get everything if you sign up at Coach Dan John over on Patreon. And thank you for all you guys, for all your support through all the years. Let's get started today, okay? We've got a lot of questions. First question is from Kevin. And Kevin says, how effective is the Easy Strength Olympic List for Weight Loss program when done with light weight? Well, Kevin, um, the weights are light. That's, I mean, well, it's a hard thing to explain to people, and I'll be honest with you. Um, what's light? Now, that's a tough issue. Um, you know, uh, half my max deadlift is 315. But if I'm doing 315 with a thick bar or a snatch grip deadlift, it suddenly becomes heavy. So I think the program, Kevin, is fine. Uh, and I guess I, I, I don't like to define what light means to somebody or medium or, hev or heavy because it just depends. So I'm doing, I'm doing the same thing right now, and I call it, uh, I call it easy strength uh, for fat loss with Olympic lifting. Um, and I've lost 10% of my mass uh, in, what, three months. Uh, hope, hopefully a lot of it's body fat. You know, we'll find out. Because uh, I'm getting ready for a weightlifting meet, uh, and I want to be a little bit lighter on the platform. Uh, my lifts are much lighter than my maxes in the beginning. I give myself plenty of time to practice. Uh, the more important thing to think about with the easy strength Olympic lifting is your tempo has to slow down with the light weights. And I talk about that, and that'll be a big section in the new book. Let's go on to the next part of your question. And if it is not effective, do you have a program recommendation that would have similar results with a light weight? Well, I think it is effective, but listen, it you got to do it. You, you can't just sit here and type questions up and ask me. And I appreciate it, but sometimes you just have to get in the gym you know, sacrifice eight weeks out of your life. And then at the end of those eight weeks, week nine, you sit back and go, yeah, that was a waste of time, which I've never had happen. Or I say, that was really a good idea, but next time I do it, you know, I should do more of this or that. And I think that's really what the job of a good coach is. And I also think that's the job of a smart trainer. Try it, do it, then go back and make it perfect. Boy, I hope that helps. Thank you. Our next question is from Adam, and Adam asked this question. I wanted to ask if you have trained anyone specifically for paddle sports before, and if this is something you have given any thought to. The answer, Adam, would be no, and the follow-up to the second question would be uh, no. But that doesn't mean that um, general strength training doesn't help. Uh, one of my books somewhere in one of my libraries is the complete strength training book, and in that book, there are uh, workouts for canoeists and paddle, various paddle sports. Um, rowing has, of course, a great tradition in the weight room. But I would say almost universally, uh, if you're not an Olympian, doing a basic full body, whole body workout three days a week, um, push, pull, hinge, squat, loaded carry, uh, do some mobility work in between. Basically, just go to danjohnuniversity.com and sign up for the workout generator. That's going to probably be the best thing for the uh, armchair paddleboarder, the armchair uh, paddle sporter. Uh, I hope that helps. Um, uh, I I know that a uh, hundred years ago, canoeing and paddleboarding were huge sports on the east coast of the United States. And it's interesting, but many men who were who raced turned weightlifting a hundred years ago to be great at the sport. So it's nothing new under the sun, as always. I hope that helped. Thank you. We have a question from Evan. I have been following your kettlebell easy strength program, and I have a question on the squat. Oh boy! So easy strength and the squat question. Hmm. I've only answered this about 8,000 times, so let's make that 8,001. You recommend the gobble squat of 1 times 10 as a warm-up. And he didn't say as a warm-up, I added it. I've always been a big fan of Mike Boyle's work on single-leg training. I like Mike, so do not even think about putting me and Mike head-to-head, because -head, he's a good friend and we agree on everything. 
and the bilateral deficit, boy, that's a lot of big words next to each other, as well, and wanted to replace the goblet squat with the RFESS, kettlebells held in the side, hand side by side, almost like a straight leg trap bar deadlift, still doing one set of 10. Uh, I think that's rear foot elevated split squat. Yeah, that's fine. No, why not? It's, uh, many people in my family have... Uh, put their health and life aside to your freedom to do all kinds of things like this. So go ahead. Um, I like your thoughts on training as a place to get strong and therefore favoring a heavy squat over single leg training. I just also don't like single leg training. However, in this scenario, I can reload the rear foot elevated split squat as heavy, if not heavier than the dumbbell kettlebell rack squat. Okay. Uh, any downside here? Um, yeah, you got to do lunges correctly every single time. Uh, I know that we're not as freaked out as we used to be about the knees over the toes or whatever, but you know, I've, uh, my good friend Stu McGill's even talked about, uh, how we have this new kind of injury that's never been seen before called a split pelvis caused by personal trainers overdoing the lunge pattern. So <laughs> thank you, personal trainers for inventing a new injury. Uh, not a true squat pattern, but if the bottom line is getting stronger, I'm still achieving that. It looks like, you, Evan, you already made your mind, so I, uh, yay, I'm behind you 100%. Uh, also, if I have the capacity to load at 2 by 5 versus 1 set of 10, is that something to consider? I am assume 1 times 10 was programmed due to limitations in loading the goblet squat. No, it's not. that's not correct, Evan. Uh, the reason we do the 1 set of 10 is that squatting, just never seems to work on easy strength. Um, uh, the movement of squatting is very important. The patterning of the squat is very important, uh, but it's really hard to make it work. Now, if you're a Bulgarian Olympic lifter or uh, a Chinese Olympic lifter, you're probably going to squat three times a day, seven days a week and have no issues. But that's a lot of that's genetics and luck of surviving those systems. Um, yeah, I just... Uh, for, for most of the people I work with, the goblet squat doesn't work in the easy strength protocols. And then, but you should squat every day, the movement, not necessarily try to kill yourself. Hope that helped. We have a question from Felipe. And Felipe asks, is there any way of combining hypertrophy training for mass gains with the Olympic lifts? Well, I mean, Felipe, when I did the Olympic lifts, I put on 40 pounds in four months. Uh, I put on 20 kilos in four months. <laughs> How much mass do you need to gain, man? Uh, if you're if you're throwing uh, body weight plus over your head every day in the snatch and body weight plus, plus, plus over every day in the clean and jerk and then front squatting, uh, you're going to put some mass on. Um this is what Tommy Kono recommended, by the way. So I actually think there's value, but I would still do an eight week build up to an Olympic lifting meet. And then the Monday after the Olympic lifting meet is done, if you can go back to bodybuilding, which is what I'm doing now in my career. Uh, I am taking a little bit longer to get ready for weightlifting meets instead of eight weeks. I'm trying, if I can, to get 10, 11, 12, but you know, I'm cause I'm doing the easy strength for Olympic lifting protocol. But yeah, I, I just think you have one of two answers, either just Olympic lift and see what happens or do the Kono method of Olympic lift, compete and meet, start bodybuilding on the following Monday. Uh, all those roads will get you there. And remember, the stronger you get in the Olympic lifts, the stronger you're going to be in those hypertrophy movements. We have a question from Brady. I'm looking for some advice about my career path. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, don't do what I did. Uh, I'm a 35-year-old personal trainer working at a hospital-based wellness center. That's interesting. The past 13 years, I've been fortunate enough to build a clientele of 45-ish full-time clients. Well, that's a big load. That's impressive, Brady. Mainly working with people over 50 with goals of maintaining or restoring their quality of life after an orthopedic or health event. And, and, and it'd be nice if they could do it before... Uh, wouldn't that be nice there? Let me just break it. Let me just throw it out. Wouldn't it be nice if people took care of this stuff before they went to the surgeon? Um, that's kind of what I do. My issue is the hospitals getting out of the wellness business. Ugh. 
and letting a big box gym take over. I am so sorry to read that. And that is, uh, A, I don't think that reflects sound judgment. Wow, that's strong, but I just don't think that's a good idea. But what do I know? The new club wants a younger clientele. Yeah, of course, you know, because so many people in their late teens and early 20s, uh, it's so common to get total knees and total shoulders. Uh, and their advertising reflects everything I dislike about the industry. You can imagine what I'm talking. Oh, I know well. Yeah. I've been trying hard to navigate my path forward, start my own studio gym or stay put and deal with the BS. Not looking for answers, just words of wisdom. Um, you know, a couple times in my career, um, I'm sorry, Brady, um, I've done what you've done. I've said, you know, I don't fit here anymore. And I've moved on. And it's always a tough transition, but in hindsight, I'm always much happier, much smarter when I do that. Uh, I like the idea of opening a studio. Uh, I think a gym that specializes in plus 50 uh, can charge a lot of money. Um, set your, you know, it'll be nice because you can have certain kinds of machines that will assist people over, over 50. Uh, your loads don't have to be crazy. Um, you certainly can have a lot more bands and, you know, bands and stretchy stuff, uh, resistance bands of all kinds, which are much cheaper than iron. Uh, your kettlebell selection can be, you know, very small. Your dumbbells can be used for waiter, waiter walks, rack carries, uh, suitcase carries. Yeah, I, I've always tried to leave before I became the problem. You know, I tell people, I don't want people who find problems. I want people who find solutions. Any jackass can find a problem. You know, it takes some insight and courage to fix a problem, find a solution. Um, if you want to do your own studio, I applaud you. You got 45 clients. Um, uh, make it a plus 50 gym. Uh, just do what you're already doing and, and good luck to you. Uh, if you're looking for an investor, let me know. Thank you. We have a question from Jeffrey. I have my first strongman comp coming up in May. Um, so this podcast will be out in time for this question. Uh, though when it gets onto things like uh, Instagram and some of the other things, uh, it might be dated, but he'll get the answer before May. There are a total of five events. That's a, not a huge uh, uh, strongman contest. Uh, max deadlift, log reps, uh, log press for reps, I apologize, farmer carry, power stairs, and finish with stones. Events start at 10 and go well into the afternoon. Been there. How do you approach nutrition hydration throughout a day of max effort events? You know, I I, I think it's brutally easy. Um, uh, I, I don't know if I should give you a name brand, but I, I, at the dollar store here, they have the $1 uh, Pedialyte knockoff. Uh, Pedialyte's about eight bucks a bottle, but over at the dollar store, they're a dollar a bottle. Uh, I always uh, pack one or two of those. Um, I would get yourself a good size cooler, and there's a couple things you can do. First, uh, sandwiches might be one of the worst things you can do for caloric uh, density. They have too many calories per bite, but in a strongman competition, it's not a bad idea. Um, you can either make sandwiches before or do what I used to do. I would bring a loaf of bread. Uh, 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 a mustard, squeeze top mustard, a squeeze mayonnaise, and then various lunch meats. And I know they're bad for you and various cheeses. And I know cheese is bad for you. Let's see what's good for you anymore. I don't remember. Um, and I would just make sandwiches at the event. And very often I noticed that that would bring other competitors over and we'd actually have some nice conversations. Um, I think a uh, uh, Pedialyte or two, uh, water, 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 water as best you can. Um, I like to drink a, a lot of coffee before I compete, uh, which does have a bit of a diuretic effect in the hot sun. Um, what I've picked up to the years and I wish I'd have been better about it. You know, I never worried about sunburn or getting too hot from the sun. Um, I do think in hindsight that a few times when I wore my uh, river hat, if you've ever seen the, uh, when I was on the Nile, I used to wear my Indiana Dan hat uh, versus Indiana Jones, you know. If I would wear that at a competition, 
keeping the sun off the top of my head and then around the ears and brim seemed to help me a lot. Um, there, there's some ugly hats you can buy. Uh, wearing your sun sunglasses helps you a little bit too. I know, odd. Hat and sunglasses, why does that help? I don't know. But the constant beating down of the sun adds up. Um, I know a lot of people bring those uh, camper chairs, the canvas ones. Uh, I always find, well, the one I'm sitting in right now, I like to bring a church chair or two. I call folding heavy, uh, the heavy duty folding chairs. Um, I find them a lot better. Uh, those canvas chairs where you sink into them. This is going to sound, again, people listening are probably going, what a bunch of wimps. But getting out of those canvas chairs, they're with those, the armrests are here, and then you sink way down, especially if you weigh, you know, what a strong man or Highland gamer wears. You know, you're, 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 your butt is about six inches off the ground, five inches off the ground, four inches off the ground, three inches as the day goes on. Whereas if you got a chair like this, which is a folding chair, you know, it doesn't have the armrest. You can sit down and then you're, you can just roll up and go. And I know it sounds like a small thing. So uh, big cooler, couple Pedialites, maybe throw in an extra one for an emergency, like if somebody else bonks uh, uh, in the American sense, not in the uh, European sense. <laughs> well, they might, after bonking, they might need something too. Um, uh, a hat that doesn't make you look like a total idiot. Sunglasses. Um, uh, appropriate amounts of food. Those are the things that help me the most uh, in the packing. I would try, if I were you, to have my pack. If the event's on Saturday, I would have the bulk of my packing done on Wednesday. I mean, it doesn't mean necessarily I would have every sandwich made or anything, but... I would have the cooler ready to go, the chairs ready. If it's if I'm driving to the event, the chairs and the cooler are already in the vehicle uh, in some cases, uh, just ready to go, and we just bring out the few supplies the morning of or the night before. Let's continue. Um, how do you approach nutrition, hydration throughout a day of max effort events? Uh, basically, drink when thirsty, eat when hungry, and, and stay ahead of it. Oh, and by the way, if you can, uh, if you can get a big, a carafe of coffee or whatever you like to drink that's good energy. I personally like coffee. I know some of these other guys drink these magic can drinks. I don't trust the chemicals in those. Uh, how do you approach rewarming back up before each event? Uh, basically, I don't do very much at all. The smartest thing I ever did was at the uh, uh, World Superweight Championships or something, where a friend of mine showed up with a kettlebell and at about five o'clock at night, I'd been there since 8 a.m., I did a couple sets of kettlebell swings, and I, I found that really good. But really, if you just kind of bounce around, I mean, with the adrenaline, with the audience there, you're not going to need much. I don't know what equipment I'll have access to throughout the day. I th I'm thinking I'll bring my 24K, do some swing snatches, presses before each event to get the blood pumping question mark, Jeffrey. I think that's a really good idea. And one thing, if you can, I always put the kettlebell in the back seat, and then I put the the, uh, the seat belt shoulder thing through it, and I really lock it down tight in the back seat of a car. I don't know if you can have your kids or dogs or whatever, but a kettlebell will do more damage to a car on a quick stop than anything I've ever discovered in my life. And so I think you'll be happy that you uh, locked and loaded it in. And good luck to you, Jeffrey. I hope you do well. Okay, bye-bye. We have a question from Onik. I'm a young arm wrestler. I am 18, and I'm looking for a good way to train my strength. Unfortunately, arm wrestling is not a very popular sport as of yet. Really? Things have been around forever. And I have failed to find any arm wrestling-specific routines made by knowledgeable veterans of weightlifting such as yourself. Do you have any training recommendations for arm wrestling? That's ah, interesting, and uh, I'll just show you up there. I'm not going to pull them out, but those are my uh, strength and health collections. Uh, man, I tell you, back in the early 60s when the Petaluma arm wrestling thing became big, they actually had a number of articles, but it comes down to just this. Uh, by the way, my friend Pavel, uh, I think it was in arm wrestling that he destroyed his elbow, uh, so be careful. But really, it's going to be about building tension. So I'm not sure you could do much better than exercises that d demand tension. And let me just give you the quick ones. Uh, deadlift, thick bar deadlift, pull up, thick bar pull up. 
Uh, you want to have the best grip you can, so anything you do with a thick bar is going to be valuable. I'm sure that people would tell you to do the crushers and things like that and all the other grip strength stuff, but you need a very specific kind of tension across. Uh, it is also possible for you to set up, and this is probably a pretty good idea. At first, you might just want to have some bands. Is So you, you get your elbow in the lock position, and at first, maybe just hook up some bands uh, you know, against the wall and just practice that, that crush move. And then also practice that, oh, I'm in trouble movement. Uh, and so you get a lot of time doing that. But remember, it's going to be maximal tension. you got to learn to turn tension on or off in a moment, which can be very difficult. Uh, do your best to learn the best techniques you can in this sport. Uh, from what I've been told by people who are good at this, it's one of the most technical sports in the world that no one seems to appreciate. Uh, in the same way that shot putting and hammer throw, discus and javelin are extremely technical sports, but everyone just kind of goes, oh, it's just big people. That's not true at all. It takes, there is, a, there is a very important kind of technique you need to have. Work on tension. Uh, if you don't have thick bars, you can just wrap towels around a bar. Uh, I'm sure you can come up with something with, uh, uh, you can probably buy something online that imitates thick bars. And I think you'll be glad you did that. Uh, by the way, if you've ever done pull-ups with a uh, towel wrapped around, if you're too lazy to do that, you can take oven mitts from the kitchen and do some pull-ups with oven mitts. That's a nightmare. Uh, I one time did the uh, the RKC snatch test with the 28s, with a 28, with an oven mitt on. And I got to tell you, man, after that, I feared no snatch test the rest of my life because it was so hard on my grip. So these are just some ideas. Uh, I would continue searching in people who know what they're talking about and hopefully we can help you there. Okay. Thank you, Monica, and good luck to you. We have a question from Dylan. That's a great name. I love what you are currently doing with the Olympic lifts, easy strength followed by heavy hands. I was considering doing this, but I strictly use kettlebells and don't have access to a bar. You must live in Utah. <laughs> access to a bar. Yeah, I thought it was funny. This leads me to two similar questions. Can you touch on why you shouldn't kettlebell snatch heavy like you would with the barbell? Well, you can. It's just, well, it's, it's you can do anything you want, Dylan. Uh, but it's not the same as, it's just not the same. Uh, I would much rather see you do uh, snatch the 24K 200 times in 10 minutes than see you hurt yourself with a 48 for a couple. Uh, that's just my own opinion. Can you touch on why you shouldn't kettlebell snatch heavy like you would with the barbell? And also, too, the, the, it's the Olympic sport of the snatch and clean and jerk. And the kettlebell snatch is just something we do for certs. Also, is there a way you think I could do a similar program with just kettlebells? Yeah, just, yeah, you, why don't you do, I don't know, 500 swings followed by a heavy hands. I mean, that would... When I do the 10,000 swing challenge, I don't do anything else. That's all you need. Maybe try this. Try 250 swings and then go heavy hands. Uh, try a, a five or 10 minute period of snatching and then go for your heavy hand walks. In fact, I hate to say this because I spent so much time putting together the workouts, but that might be a better fat loss protocol anyway. You've got two very inefficient ways of exercising back to back. Because doing kettlebell snatches is a lot of work and you don't go anywhere. And heavy hands is a lot of work and all you're doing is going for a walk. So try it. Get back to me. Raul uh, emailed me. Raul, uh, Raul asks, my 10-year-old son loves playing football and baseball. Yeah, because he's 10. That's what 10-year-olds should be doing. He is sometimes unable to control his anxiety when, for example, he is thrown out at the plate. He will start crying for a few minutes. Before you judge that, it's because he's 10 and he just had a public performance error. And 10-year-olds don't have the skill set of just shrugging it off. At least I don't know of any. I used to cry all the time at 10. In fact, hell, I'm almost 64 and I cry all the time. Uh, he gets it together after a few minutes and I think that's okay, uh, Raul. I have told him that he will eventually make mistakes 
you, let me, I want you, I want to correct what you said here. I have told him that he will eventually make mistakes and he should forget about it. I don't know what kind of life you've had, Raul, but I make mistakes all the time and I have to fix them. I have to apologize for them. I have to make excuses for them. And I go out of my way to not make the same mistakes over and over and over. But, but life is life and I seem to be able to do it over and over again. Um, I have also tried practicing box breathing with him. That has helped. Uh, is that the one, two, three, four, hold it, let it out, hold it, four breaths in, four second pause, four breaths out, four second pause. Is that box breathing? That's a very good system. Uh, I hope that works. Do you have any techniques to help athletes regulate anxiety and tension? Yeah, I have an entire book dedicated to Raul. It's called Now What? With a question mark. And I go into a lot of depth on that. Uh, the number one thing is we actually, if someone's going to break down in, in a uh, public performance, we actually practice making the mistake and getting over it. It's an, actually a skill set we use. Uh, I hope that works. Also, your son's 10. I mean, it's, he's 10. This is what 10 year olds do. Uh, now if he was 20 and still doing it, we'd have a completely different conversation. Hope that helps. We have a question from Richard and Richard says, I have a question for you with regards to purchasing a new kettlebell. This is a question I cannot believe how often I answer. Currently I have double twenties, double 24s, a 28 and a 32. And I'm not sure you really need any more, but let's do it. I was thinking about buying the beast, but am torn between that and another 28. I love double cleans, presses, and squats with the 24s, especially for armor building. And so another 28 may have more use. But the beast looks great, predominantly for heavy swings. I know you he hate either or questions, but I really like to get your advice. Uh, we use the beast to help load up stuff. We use the beast when I'm showing off. We don't use the beast very often. I'd say the double 28s from the heart. Uh, I like I like doubles. Um, there's just because I have so many barbells and I have all the all the weight plates. We we just don't use the 48 very often. No. So for me, I'd go with the doubles. And I like your idea about doing the armor building. That's a good idea, Richard. And I hope it helps. Thank you. We have a question from Jody. Ugh. I have a pretty bad case of diastasis recti. It's that issue I think women get after birth, I think. Uh, it's been ongoing since a laparoscopic gallbladder removal, oh, back in 2002. So this is different. Okay. The doctor says there's no hernia, so it's just the split that's pretty large and kind of painful in my abdominum. Is there anything you can recommend weightlifting wise that might help close the big gap and enable me to do squats and deadlifts again? Uh, Jody, I can't give you medical advice, but the only people I've known who's ever recovered from this, it's always been surgical, so, but I can't give you medical advice. Uh, certainly there's not going to be a weight room answer to it. Now there are pelvic floor exercises that might help you overall. Uh, I can't remember what the, the initials are, but it's when you, you squeeze down there, you squeeze down there a lot. Kegels, Kegels, uh, Kegels seem to help some women with pelvic floor issues. But in the case of this, I, I would like you to go back in and get some, uh, a medical checkup on this. Okay. 2002 is a way long time to be dealing with pain. And what did you say? Uh, large and painful issues. Let's get that looked at. Okay. Thank you. Brad says, and he repeats something that always cracks me up when people ask questions. I know you loathe the hypothetical binary questions. I do. So let's ask one. Like what's the one movement you would do if you could only do one. And I've heard you say that you would take your glute and I've heard you say that you would take your glute loop on the road and rely on a lot of body weight work and walks during your travels. Exactly what I do. But I do have space for a few kettlebells and even a barbell and some bumpers for clean and press front squats and snatches. 
what would you pack for a two to four week RV trip? What would you pack for a two to four week RV trip? I've actually thought of this before. It'd be so fun. Uh, basically, I would pack the barbell. Um, and depending on your strength levels, you have to figure this out yourself. But either like the 35s and the 25s, okay? Because that would give me a lot of options with just 165 pounds in the bar. I'd be able to do almost almost any workout I can figure out. With just those, with just those plates. So for those of you in kilos, an Olympic bar, ten kilo and fifteen kilo plates. Um, that would be my first. Uh, if you want to bring a, a kettlebell in addition, I don't know your strength levels, but the one that you can do presses and swings with and goblet squats. And honestly, uh, the bar, those four plates, and a single kettlebell might be pretty good. Bring along a suspension trainer. I don't think you ever have to go to a gym another day in your life. Thank you. Oh, and look up my transformation program and figure if something like three sets of eight with a minute rest on the road is something you could do three days a week. All right. Thank you. We have a question from Marcus. And actually, uh, I read these before. And so, Marcus, I actually did some extra homework for you. I compete and teach historical fencing in Helsinki, Finland. Fencing, of course, is an, is a ipsilateral sport. So it's common for athletes to develop asymmetry, asymmetrically, just like I imagine throwers do, and we, and we do a little bit, yeah. I tweaked my left knee some years ago, and I visited a, a physical therapist who helped me with good results. He asked me, have you been in a car accident before? He asked because my right side was so much more developed than my left side. It's something he usually sees only when someone has had the driver, has been the driver when the car gets T-boned. I was mortified to hear this. Since then, I've incorporated one-sided exercises, such as one-arm rows, one-arm presses, lunges, and split squats into my training, which I like. Good for you. Thanks for thinking also, Marcus. We don't usually get that on some of these questions. Is matching reps on both sides the correct approach, or do you suggest something else? Well, before I even move on, what I always suggest is if you have a strong side, in a less strong side, or as some people joke, a strong side and a stronger side, then I always let the, the, the numbers from the weaker side dictate the total numbers. So if my left side's pressing two times and my right side's pressing 13, uh-uh. We're going to do two on both sides and see if we can slowly get those sides to catch up. Um, I know you're not a fan of lunges. Are there any other one-sided leg exercises you do like and that you would suggest doing in a group setting? Group sizes are up to 20. Yeah, I, I mean, for, for fencing, and I mentioned I, I watched some collegiate fencing just to kind of figure out what's going on. I understand why you lunge in that sport because that is the sport. It That and tele, telemarking are the only two sports that you can really sell me on the value of lunges because that's what the sports do. Um, yeah, so lunges. But the other one we call the Jefferson lift. Um, it sometimes has a different definition. But So basically, you're going to get in the split position. Uh, you're going to step over the bar. The weight is between your legs. And you're going to do uh, split deadlifts, bringing the uh, barbell up between. your. So your left leg out front, your right leg's in the back. And you bring the barbell up between the legs. Uh, I think it's, you know, it's an exercise you don't see many people do anymore, but I still think there's some real value to it. Uh, another, there's other variations and it'll be called something else sometimes, but it's also known as a split stance deadlift, but however you, whatever you decide to call it, uh, it's a good exercise and I hope it helps. Um, uh, he finally states, we have plenty of kettlebells around for everyone at our disposal. One thing you might want to try, it's an older exercise, but the kettlebell snatch into the split position. So instead of just locking the finish out vertically like we do in the certs, you move into a split stance. Um, the timing has to be practiced a little bit, but it might be something you want to try. Try it on your own first, and if you like it, then share it with everybody else. Uh, it's nice to hear uh, kind of a different uh, question for once. Thank you. 
Well, there you go, ladies and gentlemen. That's episode number 87 of the danjohnuniversity.com podcast. Now, remember, you had questions, I like to answer them. Go to podcast at danjohnuniversity.com. Send them in. I'll do my best to answer each and every one. And until next time, uh, let's all just keep on lifting and learning, okay? Thanks so much. Bye-bye.